but to, what I would love to see more of is brands come in and they actually design experiences that help people. Um, you know, if you're a sponsor of uh, um, the NFL, for example, well, how can you make the fan experience better by, by creating some, something around that? Um, instead of creating a commercial, can you create a film? Um, you know, can you create some uh, uh, integration into a video game that actually will be beneficial to the players w- within that game? Creator brands are the ones that, that uh, add that value. But to be a great creator, you also have to be a member of that community. Uh, you can't just parachute in from the outside and say, like, I understand all the nuances uh, that are happening within this, this community. You have to be a member of it. You have to be active and understand um, um, the values and the rituals and the symbols and the stories and the history of that community in order for you to really add value and to be a, be a true creator within it. All right, today we got Frank Cooper with us, who is a longtime marketing executive, currently CMO at BlackRock. But you started your career in the music industry, which I always love to see. So it would be great to start there with you. First, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Yeah, it'd be great to start off with the music career piece of it because you worked at Motown and you worked at Def Jam as well. And you worked at both of those labels at pretty influential times for them. What stands out most to you from that time? What are you most proud of? Wow. Well, you know, first of all, it's funny because people will say you came from the music industry. How are you connecting this to what you're doing, whether that was at PepsiCo or here, here at BlackRock? And uh, I got to tell you, those were some of the most foundational experiences that have shaped pretty much everything that I've done since. And when I think back to Motown, though, Motown was, it was interesting because, you know, Motown early on was all about assimilation, right? It's about taking black culture and cultivating it in such a way that it can appeal broadly, you know, and, uh, you know, how, you know, how the music sounds, the way they walk, the way they talk, et cetera. It gave you Smokey Robinson and, and Dinah Ross and Jackson 5 and Marvin Gaye. And, and that worked really well. In the 90s, it became more about how to evolve that. And so um, I thought it was a really in- interesting juncture, and, and I was really excited to be there because um, you know, at that time, people didn't really want to talk about pure assimilation. They wanted to be authentic to themselves. And so how do you take that Motown uh, ethos and, and make it work within uh, you know, the culture at that time? And uh, you know, we ended up having Boys to Men and, and ABC and Queen Latifah and... and um, and it was, it was fascinating to see that. I think we're still at that juncture where R&B is still trying to find its place, honestly. And we can talk more about that. But I think Motown at that time became a symbol for how to evolve R&B in a way that um, fit the culture of the day. Def Jam, though, was completely the opposite. And, and people look back at it. People today think it was inevitable. They, they think um, you know, hip hop's the number one genre across the world. And, uh, and it seems inevitable. But at the time... Um, some people were wondering whether hip hop would even last. You know, they were saying, hey, is this a fad or not? And, um, and, and what I loved about it was that those who were in that game, those who were at Def Jam at the time, you understood that this was not just about the music. It was about the, the deep cultural sensibility that actually propelled that whole genre, you know, doing it on your own, uh, operating outside the mainstream and, um, and, and Def Jam and overcoming struggle and, and teaching people how to overcome struggle. And so for me, that became like the, the most invigorating part of, of being uh, um, there at Def Jam. And then you just saw artists come through that at the time were just um, creating incredible momentum. You know, we had, you know, the month of the man with Method Man and Red Man. You know, we had Jay-Z come through, Kanye, you know, at DMX. And it was just this massive um, kind of momentum that kept building. And it all, for me at least, reinforced this idea of, they're at, the, at their best, they're teaching people how to overcome struggle. And, and in the, by the mid-90s, what I thought was the most interesting, well, and that's probably one of the, in, in the history of music, one of, one of the, the more interesting time periods, because you had, you know, the, the flannel shirts up in Seattle, and grun- the grunge movement happening, and, and that was, had a lot of momentum, and you had hip-hop. And if you look at the trajectory of those two genres, they went completely in the opposite direction. And grunge was purely about 
suburban angst, you know, um, you know, like, oh my God, you know, I don't have meaning and, you know, what do I do? And, um, and I'm, I'm not trying to belittle it, but that's kind of where the, the, the center of gravity was. And meanwhile, hip hop was like, how do we win despite the fact that everyone has, a, the, the mainstream has their foot out trying to trip us up? How do we win? How do we get past that? How do we overcome the struggle? How do we do it on our own? And to me, that's, that's what I remember more than anything else. Um, and, and, and then finally, finally, the artists um, that I've connected with the most um, were the ones that actually embraced that the most. I loved, you know, Chuck D and Public Enemy. You know, um, and and um, Chuck D and Public Enemy to me, um, you know, represented probably the more extreme version of that. I love Jay Z, and um, you know, how can you not love Jay Z and what what, he, what he's accomplished? And then some people may may uh, you know, Kanye West is Kanye is Kanye, um, but. Kanye to me is genius um, because Kanye was able to change our the, our sensibility of what hip hop could be. You know, um, you know, at that time he was using music sources that others weren't using. He was using voice in, in a different way. Um, the the um, the lyrics were were not as combative as, as some others. It, came, it expanded the universe of what was possible in hip hop, and I think Kanye played a, a, a central role in that. And so. Um, so I, I really have a lot of respect for him uh, and, and uh, what he did at that time for Def Jam. And, 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 and I've always carried that with me. That piece about the artist specifically in the grunge era and in hip hop at that same time, I think it's so key because when people talk a lot about Gen X and Generation X, I think the first thought that may go to people's minds is not just grunge, but thinking of the image of a Kurt Cobain or... Yeah you know, so like a Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins or one of those and all of what they embodied. But on the other side of that, Ice Cube and Dre and Snoop Dogg are also Gen X and a very different vibe in terms of what they wanted their music to represent. Not that angst isn't something that they didn't have in their young 20s as well, but it was a very different way of communicating their reality, their experience. And I think people don't always necessarily connect that when they talk about Gen X, at least in a mainstream way. No, Dan, I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, what's fascinating is that they both were, both those genres were, were tackling the same problem, right? They both looked out and said, man, these traditional institutions are kind of failing us. I, I can't rely on them as, as much as, as, as I used to. The definition of success that's been put out there um, is not something that I adhere to. They were fighting against the same things, but they took two different paths. And, and I personally believe that the reason, one of the reasons why hip hop prevailed in, in that is because it helped you to move forward. You know, um, you know, if you, if you were, it, it was invigorating. It was, it, uh, it would inspire you to try to move forward, not, to, not to wallow in any kind of sadness. And I think there's value in that too, but it was about, okay, it is what it is. And how do we move forward? You know, make it happen on your own. And they did it not only in the lyrics, they did it in, in, the, in the entirety of their behavior. You know, that's when, you know, you started to see um, you know, artists become uh, entrepreneurs. You started to see them actually extend their, their brand into to other businesses. And, um, and, and they built an enterprise, each, each one of them that were successful, they built an enterprise based on the music. And that to me has become the blueprint for, no pun intended, the blueprint for, for how artists are thinking about it today. Even if you fast forward to this current moment, um, I've never seen this much money flow into music. You know, uh, investors uh, now buying out catalogs, and, and we're part of that too. We announced a, a recent partnership with Influence Media. You know, uh, uh, Lilette Pizarro and, and Renee McLean, uh, um, and, and so we're in it, in it also. But I've never seen this much money flow into music. But to me, it's an extension of what hip hop started, which is there is no inauthenticity in your uh, getting paid. You know, um, you can be, you can get paid, you can catch a check, you can extend your business. Uh, in, in a variety of ways and still remain true to yourself. And, um, and I think many of the people today who are reaping the benefits of that should look back to the early days of hip hop and thank, and thank those artists. And I think that speaks a lot to your career as well, because you were able to take your experience, you saw the potential of what these artists could do with their brands 
And then you were able to work with a lot of the brands themselves to help bring those artists to the forefront and be, hey, you can help tell the story for this brand. We can help augment not just what you're doing, but help this brand do it as well. And especially in that time, in the 2000s, 2010s, we started to see more and more of that. And you're at the forefront for so much of that. Yeah, you know, the thing that always bothered me when I, when I saw celebrity um, sponsorships and endorsements and, and advertisements um, was that it was purely transactional. Like people would say, you know, I'll write a check to this artist and uh, I'll put them in my commercial and we'll have the most beautiful drink shot in this commercial. They're like, oh, closer, closer, closer. Yeah, beautiful. We, we've captured it. We won. But most fans and, and, and consumers, they understand that game and they're like, you know what? Um, I'm glad that ours caught that check. Beautiful thing. And I'm happy for that. But I don't believe there's any real connection between that artist and the brand or that product. And therefore, that was completely wasted money. And so the angle that I took, the one I took is, is that uh, I knew that virtually every celebrity that I've ever met, they all have their own aspirations. They want to do certain things that they cannot do within their current industries. There's always an artist a filmmaker who wants to make a certain kind of film that they can't make. There's an artist that wants to do a certain song or put it out in a certain way that they cannot do, or they want to extend it into new areas. And so I spent most of my time trying to understand what are their aspirations? What are they trying to accomplish that they can't accomplish through their, their own ecosystem? And, and found that connection point to what we wanted to do. And, and, and to me, that was the unlock. And it was like, if I can find that shared aspiration, um, then I could start to express shared values, shared experiences, a shared world, world view that was true. And, and, and to me, if you can capture that, and you don't always win on it, but if you can capture that, that's gold. And, and, and I try to do that across you know, as many artists as I, as I could. Yeah, and I think even that breakdown that you had it, you're seeing more of the good examples now, just seeing some of the great deals that come through. You're still seeing some of the ones that you may shake your head at, whether it's the Instagram post where they're just getting a check for something. But in general, you're starting to see more of the long-term value add. And I feel like the Beyonce deal that you had done with Pepsi specifically, that feels like one that falls more in line with there's a longer term opportunity here to really highlight and, and tell that story. Yeah, you know, um, this is funny because uh, when, when I first started having the conversations with Beyonce and, and, and her team, I was like, okay, this is a long shot. You know, Beyonce uh, is very, very particular um, and rightly so. Um, and, um, you know, reluctant to do anything that didn't fit um, what she truly believed and didn't fit her, her values. So I spent a lot of time with the team trying to understand what they wanted to accomplish. And, you know, her part of her genius, I think she's genius on many levels, but part of it is um, she, under, she understood that she wanted to release things in ways that artists have not done before. And she wanted to create content um, that complemented the music in ways that uh, artists have not done before, like a visual, a visual album. And so I said, we can help with that. You know, we can help, we can help launch the album. We've got millions of packages that are going out every day. Uh, and so what if we what if we did a bespoke design and you're on those packages and it relates to your album? Um, what if we actually help fund that visual album? Uh, um, what if we help put your single out? But most important, what if you got in front of 120 million people in the Super Bowl halftime and um, and re and then release something after that, that, you know, so that it became the most powerful ad possible for you? Uh, uh, to drive sales of your album. And that's really what made the connection. Because, um, uh, you know, if I, if I went to Beyonce and her team and said, um, here's a piece of paper, I'm going to slip it across the table to you. And uh, there's a number on here that should make you fall out in excitement. Uh, I still would not have closed that deal. That deal would never have happened. There was no, in my mind, there was no amount of money alone that would, would get convince her to do it. Um, but it was the understanding what she was trying to accomplish and, and how we could participate in, in that in a way that benefited both of us. And so that's one, for me, one of the um, most extraordinary deals that, that I've been involved in, but also one of the most extraordinary experiences because um, I, I've learned in part why she is so good. Uh, and it, it was driving me crazy at the time, but, it, but she was 100% right. You know, we did, we did a commercial with her. And what I didn't realize is that I thought you'd look at the commercial and say, hey, make some edits here and there. 
she looked at it herself, frame by frame. And, and then she broke down the arc. And then she, I mean, she was into it and in, 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 in intense. And, and what I realized, and not just Beyonce, with other artists, uh, I've seen it with Snoop, um, you know, I've seen it with Nicki Minaj, I've seen it um, uh, with, with a, a wide range of artists, is that they put it in. They put the work in. It's not, it's not like they say, I'm, I'm this brilliant artist and I'm going to come in and, and just kind of bestow you with my brilliance and move on. They actually put in the time and, and, and they're focused and intense and uh, and they want to make sure it is the best product they can put out no matter what they're putting out. Yeah, with her specifically, you've just seen that with each album. I mean, it's like find some way to just level up and continue to do that. And even thinking back to that deal and from the consumer perspective, just seeing how everything lined up. I mean, she put the lights out after the show at that Super Bowl, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there was something else. But the, the one piece I did want to clarify with that, so if the Super Bowl wasn't in the conversation, is it fair to assume that, oh, that deal wouldn't have worked, that needed to be the thing to um, put it over the edge? No, no, it would have worked in either way. Um, um, because um, I think the Super Bowl definitely contributed to it. Because um, how many times are you going to have a simultaneous audience of 100 million plus people uh, watching something? But there were enough other things that she really wanted to do that we could help on. Um, and that didn't involve just the check. You know, the infrastructure of Pepsi at the time uh, could be helpful in so many different ways. And, and um, I think with the collection of all those things together, pull the Super Bowl out. I would have added something uh, else in it. We would have done a, a full length film together or something, you know, but um, but there would have been something that would meet her desire to break the boundaries of what has been done before um, and, and that uh, PepsiCo could actually help her deliver. And since we're talking about the Super Bowl, what did you think about the show that we had this past year with Dre, Snoop, M, 50, Kendrick, Mary? So man, I was I was almost in tears in a way because um, you know I I um so before I left PepsiCo I I renegotiated a ten year deal uh, with them um, with a couple of billion dollars and, and and um and I got to know some of the owners definitely got to know the NFL headquarters uh, 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 very well and um I thought I would never see that day uh, where you had that lineup of artists, you know, from Dre to Snoop to Kendrick to, to uh, Mary J. Blige and, and, and Eminem uh, and 50 Cent. thought you we would never see that day. Um, but more important, I, not, I thought I would never see it presented in such an authentic way. Um, you know, they didn't, they, they didn't tone down the visuals. Uh, and um, and if, do I think it was the, the absolute best performance I've ever seen? I don't think it was the best performance I, I've ever seen overall. But the collection of, of that effort and, and the collection of the artists and the, uh, and the energy and the visual presentations, for me, this, is, this, this was a seminal moment uh, uh, that I think um, we should all remember because it, it, it will open up the doors for many other artists to come. And what I realized is that they knew it too, because you could see, by the way, they were very careful what they did and made sure that they stayed within certain bounds the only person who did something semi-controversial was, was Eminem, right? With, with the when he when he kneeled a bit, um, uh, but um, th this to me was a really powerful moment. Thought I would never see it, um, and I hope that it's not a one-off. You know, I hope that um, you know as we see future NFL productions uh, as well as the Super Bowl, that we that we see a, a more black artists and that we see hip hop in particular um, play a more central role in it. I agree. I think that this one specifically helped almost if you look back to the one they had in Atlanta. And I feel like there's a lot of talk there about why couldn't we have represented Atlanta's soul, R&B, hip hop vibes that, you know, are so germane to that city. And then a show that didn't end up showing that 100 percent. And I feel like, OK, we have this here. And if you just look at the slate, there's so many cities coming up where you could see something similar for these types of artists. So. That, yeah. that could be special. Yeah. I mean, weren't you like just like so disappointed when, when, when it happened in Atlanta? It's like, wait a minute. Are you, are you, are you kidding me? It's like, you know, Atlanta's yeah, so it, music. I can't uh, believe it. Yeah. It's like, I mean, Maroon 5 definitely deserves to be on that stage. I mean, they're one of the biggest groups of the past two decades, but from a time and place and all the things lining up, it was like, come on. Yeah. It, I, I know. Yeah. I know. 
and they got all, what do you call it? We got big boy in almost as like a, you know, afterthought to be like, okay, here, we're hearing the chatter. Let's see who we could get for this one. But, that's right. Uh, let's, let's give them half a second. Uh, don't, don't look too long. You know, and that's probably, they, they will never let me program it because I, I would have gone back. I would have dug in the crates a bit. I, w- I would say, you know, let's go to the goodie mob, you know, and, and, and let's, oh, bring, yeah. let's, let's, bring, let's bring them back. But you can also, they could have softened it up. I mean, you know, Tony Braxton, you know, um, you know, and, and, and the whole of face lineup. You know, uh, from a certain era uh, could could have been on there. Um, Ludacris, he's a mainstream uh, um, star now. Um, there's so much they could have done. Uh, and, and hopefully they saw through this event um, that it was a lost opportunity. And and I think they're seeing what's happening on social media from this last Super Bowl, um, that it's, it's a powerful force uh, that they can tap into with in a way that actually improves the NFL brand. Uh, and so... I think the fear was that in some way this is going to alienate you know, those who are not on the coast, you know, the Midwest. But I, hopefully the realization is now that hip hop is not isolated to the coast. You know, hip hop is foundational uh, uh, across every geographic territory today. Right. And especially with this one, too, you had Eminem, who Midwest and one of the biggest artists of the past, you know, couple decades too so we'll see yeah i know you mentioned that this wasn't the best one which one do you got number one uh, for super bowl yeah for super bowl well you know for me um the one that was most special for me was prince um and yep, um, same. you know and and when he did um purple rain and it started to rain it's like it's something the whole thing was magical it was it was, yeah. it was incredible it was poetic it was like you couldn't script this it was beautiful exactly yeah, that was a good one. Uh, shifting gears a bit, want to talk a bit more about your role and your experience right now at BlackRock. You joined a few years ago, and it was a similar type of role given the CMO uh, position that you've had and you've had at other companies, but definitely a different type of industry and a different type of sector that you had worked in up to that point. But in hearing you in other interviews and things you talked about, trying to bring financial literacy and elevate that to the discussion has been an important piece of that. So it'd be great to hear a little bit more about what that's been like for you since you've been there and how that has taken shape. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I don't know if this is a risk or not, but but I but I took this leap. One of the things I did when I first came in was try to make um, try to convince the leadership of BlackRock that it needed to have a sense of purpose that went beyond profits, that went that went beyond uh, money. Um, I, I was working closely with a bunch of other people, we were successful in doing that, and and part of that purpose statement that we ended up with uh, included this idea of financial inclusion. That we help more and more people experience financial well-being. And so getting that built into the core of the company where we say, hey, that's our ultimate goal. Yes, money and profits, it's an outcome that we have to have to succeed. But our ultimate goal is to help more and more people experience financial well-being. So by having financial inclusion built into it, um, that was it was a, it was a, a, a huge step. Um, but I mentioned earlier that music helped me um, quite a bit. And, and, and the part that helped me is, is that I looked at culture first, like what is happening in culture that um, is urgent and important and that our industry can address. And one of the things that's happening in culture, for sure, and you can see it all over the world, is that more people are feeling like they're excluded from the opportunities for economic mobility, that they don't believe the system is working uh, in their favor. They don't have access uh, to improve their own prosperity. And so, um, you know, for me, if you, you take that cultural lens and work back to the industry, the question is, what can we do to improve that? I'm actually not a big believer in traditional financial literacy by itself. I think it, um, all the research I've seen suggests that, that it doesn't change behavior um, because it's too academic. It's filled with jargon. It's long form. You know, people's eyes glaze over when you're having the conversation. Um, but I do believe that financial education is absolutely critical. So what, I, what I've started to do is think about what are the elements that can help people move forward uh, in, 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 in becoming investors uh, in, in, in increasing their savings. And I think it's four things. I think it's knowledge, skills, community, and access. And so even if you go to Reddit, uh, one of the, 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 the trending 
uh, one of the, the most substantial subreddit threads around, is around financial education. People want to know, like, give me the information, but also help me build the skills. And then give me a community that gives me some support. And all I need after that is some access. Make it easier for me to, 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 to come in and, and, and make it safe for me to try. And, and so that's what I'm, I've been focused on is really trying to figure out um, how to, how to um, uh, you know, improve the, uh, the knowledge, skills, community, and access so that people have a, a better shot at, at uh, increasing their own sense of prosperity. Yeah. And from the work you've done so far, I feel like I can see those connections. You started a TikTok page and been posting more there, trying to connect a bit more with the, not just the younger generation, but with being able to break those, those things down. And I know another thing that you had said once you really liked how a movie like The Big Short was able to help boil these principles down and communicate it in a way to be like, hey, here it is. These con- these concepts aren't as complex as they may always seem, but let's do it in layman's terms. And I feel like I could see elements of that with some of the content that you've all put out recently. Yeah, you know, it's weird. You know, you know what, one of the things that convinced me that I, I, um, I should come into BlackRock and move over to financial services was watching that film, The Big Short, which is kind of ironic, right? Because it, it was not a, a um, favorable view of the financial services industry. But a lot of people may watch that movie and then not want to come work at No, Black I know. I know. <laughs> I know. But, but what, 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 what stuck with me was like, I have you know, a lot of friends who were in, in uh, investment and I used to ask them these questions like, so man, I mean, what's this thing called a credit default swap? And they would explain it to me. And I'm like, I think I'm fairly smart. I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, you know, um, and, and I just give up. When I saw the big short and I saw those interstitials and you saw Selena in the club, you know, or the late Anthony Bourdain in the restaurant uh, or Margie, uh, Margie uh, Rabot in, uh, in, the, in the tub with the champagne, they were explaining those concepts in really simple terms that anyone could understand. And for me, that was like an awakening. It was like, you know what? It's not that complicated, really. It's just that um, some people are making it complicated. What if we can actually deliver it in ways that people like to learn today? You know, short form, jargon free, highly visual, with relatable role models. Man, that could be like a really fascinating thing because then suddenly people could start to take steps forward and, and become part of the benefits of saving and investing. And so it was a, it, it was a really defining moment for me. Uh, and, um, and I've taken that logic and, and I'm trying to apply it uh, uh, today. You know, in TikTok, already there's already a movement happening on TikTok. I mean, if you look at hashtag Money Talk, um, um, you know, it's one of the top hashtags um, already. Um, but it, it is, in my mind, the perfect format for what I'm talking about: short form, highly visual, jargon-free, and relatable role models. And um, you know, I'm excited. We've just launched, um, so it's really early days. But I'm really excited about the potential of that platform and other platforms to finally crack the code on financial education and financial literacy and financial inclusion. Uh, um, but I think that is the pathway of, uh, forward um, for our own sense of purpose of, of, of including more people with the benefits of, of investing. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's consuming so much attention and has so much mind share over a generation. You have to be where they're at. I'm curious if there are other channels or there are other areas that you're pursuing or you're considering doing, especially this next year. I feel like things are moving so fast with everything happening, whether it's with Web3 or the metaverse. There could be endless opportunities to distill and communicate this type of information yeah well look, yeah that, that, that's such a difficult question because you know I, i'm always uh i'm always trying to figure out where things are moving next and um and timing it in a way where it can have an impact because because i've also learned the hard way that um being too early is the same as being too late <laughs> uh, the impact uh, really won't hit you uh or, or a broad enough people set of people in the way that you want um and so when i when i look at timing and change um, I think we have an opportunity in long form video. Um, you know, I think we could do things like a documentary film that, that would be really interesting uh, and helpful uh, and not just kind of the shilling of, of the brand or, or, or the company. Um, but this area of, of, of NFTs in the metaverse, it's, we're, in the, we're in the height of the hype cycle right now. So we got to get through that. Uh, um, 
and no one knows exactly how it's going to take shape. But there are a few things we do know. Uh, we do know that people want to have the experience of being in an immersive environment. Um, video games have been doing it for a long time now. And, and we saw that shift years ago in video games. Um, I don't know if you remember earlier in the video games, they used to give um, different tools and weapons and other things that people could use within the game as you started to level up. They eliminated that for a variety of reasons, including they thought it was just unfair in terms of, of pure gameplay. But they had shifted from that to accessories. Um, and so once you shift to the accessories in the virtual world, like a video game, you are, you've entered the metaverse to, uh, in, in a way. It's not as immersive as a 3D environment necessarily, but you're entering the metaverse because now you have these accessories. Um, and so imagine if you're in a virtual world and, you, and, um, and, and, and these virtual worlds are connected um, so, um, and, and you have some limited edition Nike shoes or you have uh, 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 um, some other crypto collectible. That to me is the direction it's going. What we can do is that there's some form of exchange that has to happen in these environments. And um, uh, we can be part of that exchange, number one. But then when you look at something like Decentraland, where people can buy a plot of virtual land and build what they want on on it, um, um, and and people can invest and people can start to uh, save, suddenly in, in that virtual world, this idea of financial services investing asset allocation becomes really interesting. Uh, and I think um, we have an opportunity to step in there in a way that's still authentic, but uh, but it also can deliver real value to people who are, are, are experiencing those virtual environments. So I'm very excited about the metaverse. I'm excited about NFTs within the metaverse in particular um, and, and the role that financial services can play. Yeah, I agree. It's been fascinating to see how much has changed in the past six months, you know, year plus at this point. But it's also been interesting to see more and more celebrities and especially folks in hip hop that are pushing it themselves or are changing their social avatars to whether it's board apes or some other asset that they have. So it's been really great to see those folks be ahead of the curve as well on a thing like this, because as we both know, if you're able to have them to set the direction and get their audience bought in, there could be a lot of movement, not just with, you know, who gets bought in, but who gets bought in early that could eventually set the tone for what the landscape looks like, looks like as it matures. Yeah. And, you know, I've always been, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that um, black artists in particular, but hip hop artists in general are now are getting credit for leading, being one of the leaders within technology. I think it's always happened by the way. Um, you know, when, when, when ringtones were out, um, they were leaders of it. When, when, when mobile phones and mobile communications were out, they were leaders of that. When Twitter launched, you know, uh, um, black Twitter was the hottest oh, thing on the pla- was the hottest thing on the platform, but, but it was largely unrecognized. Um, now it's being recognized. Um, and, and I'm also sensing a, a, a slight mindset shift among, uh, some of these artists. So you take that piece of it. But also this notion that um, I can be a pure consumer and, and spend, or I can build wealth. And you know, we saw seeds of that even in Jay Z's four 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 album. Um, but even when I see someone like Rick Ross come off the plane and saying, "Hey, I just did a did a, a set for someone. I got X amount of check. Uh, am I going to go out and buy another gold chain? No, I'm going to invest in this." Um, is it? There's a mindset shift in terms of what success looks like and the role that wealth plays within it. And so with the convergence of those two things, I think that um, we're entering a space that um, no, none of us know exactly how it's going to play out, but a space where new opportunities are going to come, both for artists, but also for entrepreneurs and just for people who have traditionally been excluded you know, from the, from, from, from the, uh, the benefits of, of investing and saving and wealth in general. What does your involvement in this space look like? Have you gotten deep in it with yourself, with uh, whether it's your own wallets or things that you've been tapping into? Uh, no, I'm, I'm more I'm, I'm sidelined right now um, um, for a variety of reasons. It's tricky, you know. Um, um, since I've been at BlackRock, there are a lot more restrictions <laughs> on, on, on what I, what I can do. Um, but um, the thing I've been paying the uh, closest attention to um, would be uh, crypto assets and, and in particular uh, NFTs. 
years ago, and I regret it. Someone told me early on, uh, you know, hey, you know, dip into Bitcoin. And, and and I intended to do it because I was like, you know what? Who knows where it's going to go, but I'll learn. So um, I missed that opportunity. And uh, and I feel like this thing is moving so quickly. I could easily miss this opportunity also personally, uh, unless I start um, getting involved. Because, because Dan, I don't think you can, it's moving so quickly. I don't think you can really understand it in, uh, in a deep way unless you participate in it. You know, um, right. you, know you can study it, you can see it. Uh, but you got to participate in it. So I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm, I'm not fully there yet. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, anyone that considers themselves a expert in Web3 or anything like this, I always push back because the space is growing so fast. And at the broadest extent, we're all learners in this space. We're all just gaining knowledge by day. And if we learn something interesting, we'll share it with others. But there are no experts in this. Everyone is just leveling up. And I do think that these things take time. Even as someone that studies this space for a living related to the things I do, it's still a lot. And every week you'll see something else being like, oh, what's that? But like anything else, you have to filter it down and you have to prioritize where that lines up with everything else that's there. And, and, and what are your go-to sources uh, to keep learning and keep um, deepening your under, understanding of Web3 and, 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 uh, and you know, NFTs and the metaverse? Yeah, there's a few spots that I've gone to. Like there's this newsletter, Milk Road, that I recently started checking out that has been helpful on that front. It's more of a regular digest of some of the latest things that are going on. There are some other folks in music and more broadly in media that I've been following that have either bought things or will you know add me to some of these telegrams or discord groups that are happening so so much of it has happened a bit informally but you'll see these drops happen once in a while and it's always this thing of okay you want to support this person because you're cool with them and then you know you can get the nft that has access to that but then you never know where it could go right so there's that and then on the other side of it too just looking through the headlines of some of the things that are happening I feel like now it's almost a given just with the sources that I'm checking that it will be so-and-so in many cases, a hip hop artist that's like, oh, they just did an NFT deal with this, or they just did that, or even the deal that Snoop Dogg had done and how he was able to sell, last I checked, you know, it was over $44 million worth of a NFT that had this exclusive access to a lot of his what he would normally have as a vip thing it was part of this album that he has now that he has a death row catalog so all these things have been kind of like you know little nuggets of information that just add and build to it so it's definitely been a pretty wide-ranging things but that's how i feel like i've been able to at least try to keep up with these things i love it i love it i have to look up some of those um you know one of my concerns around it is uh, this is going to be strange coming from someone who, who lives in marketing is that brands will mess this all up <laughs> you know because you know brands are now aware of how how fast it's growing how powerful it is and how um, how much people want to engage, uh, you know, with uh, NFTs and crypto and, and the metaverse. I think some of these brands are jumping in too early. Um, they would be better off learning and, 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 and taking smaller steps and not big leaps on this one, in, in my opinion. That brand piece is interesting. I feel like you had said um, recently that you feel like brands in general just needs to be more like creators. And I think if you have that type of mentality, then maybe that can help address some of these ways that you could go into an area and it may not necessarily be the best. But if you have that open perspective, you'll turn out better. A hundred percent. No, I mean, because look, brands can play across a, a wide range, right? You know, some brands um, will come in and say, we'll be at an observer. We'll just observe things and, and share that with people. It's a little bit of value in that. Some, many, many brands are still in the sponsor layer. Like, you know, we will support something and we hope we get a halo effect by just being a supporter uh, of it. There are literally just signs and billboards at, you know, at games and things like that. Um, other brands are curators. They'll say, hey, we'll weed out the stuff for you. And, and you can see that we're kind of in the game because our taste level um, will, will be evident because we are giving you the best of the best in a certain area. But the brands I think that people will love and respect and that feel like they're part of the community, community are these creator brands. Um, they actually create things that add value to people's lives. And so um, what I, we've already started to see it, um, what, 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 you, what I'd love to see more of is brands come in and they actually design experiences that help people. Um, you know, if you're a sponsor of uh, um, the NFL, for example, well, how can you make the fan experience better by, by creating some, something around that? 
um, instead of creating a commercial, can you create a film? Um, you know, can you create some uh, uh, integration into a video game that actually will be beneficial to the players w- within that game? Creator brands are the ones that, that uh, add that value. But to be a great creator, you also have to be a member of that community. Uh, you can't just parachute in from the outside and say, like, I understand all the nuances uh, that are happening within this, this community. You have to be a member of it. You have to be active and understand um, um, the values and the rituals and the symbols and the stories and the history of that community in order for you to really add value and to be a, be a true creator within it. So brands can't just hop on Twitter and say, oh, I'm pushing P. That's what you're saying. <laughs> I, you know what? Somebody's going to do that, though. You know, someone's going to do it. And, 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 you know, they already have. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it's, it's terrible, though. But, you know, that's that's what happens, unfortunately, with, with too many brands. And, and um, the, the, the great thing, in, in my opinion, is that consumers are so smart now. It's like they see exactly what it is. You will get no credit for it. You will be maligned. Um, and so uh, I just think, again, I think those brands who understand what it takes to be a creator, jump into it. If you're not ready for that, you know, you can take a step back and be a curator and say, I'm looking at the best of the best. But even then, you, you still need to be steeped in the culture and steeped in, in, in the communities that are driving. Right. And I think at the end of the day, what happens is like when you have the people that work at those companies that actually represent that culture, that's how you have more of this. If you have the outsiders trying to embed themselves in, whether it's a brand or not, there's going to be a disconnect. And I feel like that actually links back to something that you've written about recently. You had a really thoughtful um, Harvard Business Review essay, and you talked about black employees at these workplaces and a lot of these types of roles and wanting to feel safe, wanting to feel seen and wanting to feel supported. And one, I mean, I can relate to that 100% having worked in many of these roles. And I think I appreciated you writing that given the leadership roles in place that you've been in your careers. But I'm curious, how do you feel, you know, from your perspective, as that relates to you and your experience, even now at the CMO level roles and the C-suite roles that you've had for major companies. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, that article, um, I could have easily have been one of the interviewees um, because of the experiences that, that they express in the article, not feeling safe to fully express yourself, you know, so that kind of psychological safety, you know, not being seen in the fullness of who you are, you know, um, you know, and the potential that you, that you have. And not being supported, and supported, I mean, you know, um, um, g- given all the elements that can make you successful, but also being challenged to stretch into new roles. You know, I've experienced all of that and, and um, uh, all along the way. I've also had to deal with, and I think many uh, black and brown executives and women um, have to deal with this. It's a perception challenge, right? Which is, can the person sitting across from you who is in some way responsible for your growth within the company, see your full potential, you know? Um, and, and it's not like there's this kind of demonic uh, uh, um, attitude that they have toward you, but their subconscious may not allow them to see the full, so see you as a CEO, see you as a CMO. And so you're always overcoming that perception challenge. But I've been fortunate um, in that, and there's a long list of people that have um, helped me uh, achieve despite that. Um, there have been people who saw in me uh, that potential, people who've given me that opportunity uh, to stretch. And, um, and the one person that who's kind of really been in, in my life, uh, my career for most of my life is uh, Clarence Avon. And, um, and Clarence Avon, they, you know, they did the Netflix film on, on Clarence, you know, Black Godfather. Um, but early on, you know, uh, Clarence started telling me the stories of what he did, why he did it, how he approached it. And it was a sense of, kind of fearlessness that, that he had in the sense of, of um, you know, that if you fail, um, it's, it's, it's nothing more than a learning experience. Take that and use it to your benefit. Um, 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 helping to communicate. And so how do you actually, knowing that someone may not see the full potential in you, how do you actually get them to overcome that? Um, maybe if you can solve their problem, you know, figure out what their problem is, solve it. It builds confidence one but also makes you closer to them and proximity is 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 really important in order to build these kind of relationships where people are going to help pull you up and so he was really central to it um 
Um, but there have been it's, it's a long list of people in the, every step of the way that um, have um, been helpful to me because they saw potential in me uh, and, and were able to overcome it. I think to do it on a systemic level, though, we have to rethink how we train managers. And you know, managers are trained you know, to be technically proficient. They're trained to lead in a way that um, you know, find your high potential employees, et cetera. But what we're talking about here is really unlocking potential in all people. And to unlock potential in people that may not look like you requires a different set of skills. Um, you know, can you, you know, do you have the skill of humble inquiry? Do you not ask questions in a way that actually motivates people to, to connect with you? Um, you know, can you um, practice intense listening? You know, are you listening um, to a way where you really understand what that person is saying, even though the language may be different and it may be, may be shrouded in euphemisms? Um, that's the training that needs to happen with managers to really break through this and unlock the potential in people that may not look like them. And so I'm optimistic, but we have a long way to go. That's real. The The way that things are communicated makes such a big difference. And you bring it up, Clarence Avon. I've never met him personally, but even just watching through that documentary, you can just see that vibe of how he was and how he related. There wasn't this like awe factor that he had going into rooms. It was like, yeah, you know, I, I talked to Bill Clinton and I just let him know how it was. Like there was no pause in any of that. And you just saw that carry through and through. You know, he, he told me, he said, hey, Frank, look, you know, I'm from North Carolina. So, yeah, he says he's from Greensboro, but he's from Climax, North Carolina. It's like it's adjacent to Greensboro. And, 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 and he said, you know, I didn't know what was going on. He said, but early in my career, um, Joe Glazer uh, um, told me, um, you know, I want you to go in and I want you to have this conversation with this you know, head of music label and you're going to manage this artist. And he's like, yeah. You know, I don't know how to do this. You know, you know and, and, and Joe said, said something to him. He said that stuck with him for the rest of his life. He said, let me just tell you this. Every person that you're talking to, they wake up in the morning, they shower, brush their teeth, put, a, put on their pants or shoes, whatever. Uh, uh, they're just like you. There's nothing special about, uh, about them uh, beyond the fact that they're another human being. And uh, just relate to them in that way and you're going to be fine. And that's how he approaches it. So he's not... It's really fascinating. He's not in awe, but he's, he, but he's also not looking down upon anyone. It's like, I'm looking at you eye to eye. Let's figure out how we connect. Let's figure out how we can make something happen. And, and it's a remarkable skill. And, and um, I, I believe that's what, what, what's carried him through all these years. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And we're getting to the tail end here. And I'm sure that, as you mentioned, you've had a lot of people that have you know seen things in you that were able to help get you to the place you're in your career. Clarence Avon, you know, one of those folks that gave you great advice. What's another piece of advice that you've gotten in your career that really stuck with you that still resonates today? Well, well, well the best the best piece of advice, advice I had uh, was early in my career, uh, and, and I was just uh, I think I was a second year law student, uh, school student, and um, I was with a um, litigation partner and. And what he told me was that um, I told him I wanted to you know, practice law and teach law for all these reasons. And, and he said, OK, fine, 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 whatever. Uh, uh, he said, but let me just say one thing that after practicing 20 years, I've been in, in public practice and private practice, and I've seen a lot of people who were successful and those who have not succeeded. Uh, and I'll tell you the one thing that you have to remember is that if you can connect your personal interests with your professional interests, the thing that energizes you in life, you know, that gives you a sense of fulfillment, and connect that with your personal interests, you will not only do well, you will actually have this deep sense of fulfillment. And um, he said, if you don't do it, I think you'll still be successful superficially, but you'll watch your personal interests go to the wayside. And so that actually sent me on this path of, of what we now call purpose, uh, um, uh, this path of discovering like, so what am I good at? What do I love to do? And what am I good at? And how can I contribute to something bigger than myself? And I, that was it was a deep introspective uh, process, but it, but I came out of it having a sense of what I love to do, what I'm good at, how I can contribute to the world, and I've applied that. It's been it's kind of been my compass through every place that I've been, and, and it's what in part has allowed me to move from industry to industry at a very high level. You know, from entertainment to technology to uh, consumer goods and, and financial services. Um, that sense of purpose has stuck with me the entire way. That's real. That's real. 
And I think that's a good note to close on with this. I mean, normally my last question is, you know, anything you want to plug or let the travel on us know about, but I think you did it right there. <laughs> that was perfect. Thanks, yeah. Appreciate <laughs> it, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Frank, no, this was a pleasure. Really appreciate you coming on. And I feel like we'll have to, we have to check it again with you at some point. We'll see what the next few Super Bowl lineups look like. And then we could do a post game after that. Let's do it every year. I'd love to do it. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Okay.